you have lived, I think, the most craziest life of anyone that I can think of in MMA when it comes to gambling, you know, your own businesses, you know, you've done some coaching with fighters. Yes, actually, almost was a bodyguard for Tyson Fury at one point. I mean, I've had tens of thousands of dollars stolen from me for no reasons, literally just winning bets and the sportsbook manager gets mad that you beat them and so they just close your account for no reason. everyone and welcome to a brand new episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. I'm so excited to be speaking to my guest this week. You know, the sports betting landscape has just exploded in the last couple of years. I've seen it, I'm sure a lot of you have seen it as well, especially as it pertains to the fight game and MMA. And so I thought it would be fantastic to speak to someone that is a 13-year professional betting analyst pro better has been doing this since the wild west days my guest this week is luca fury luca how you doing my man hey, thanks so much for having me and yeah like you said i've been doing this since it was the wild west days is a good way to describe it now you know you can just open up fan duel or draft kings or whatever american-based sports book you prefer now and it's very easy to place a bet not so uh, often the case back in the day. There was always a game of cat and mouse with the sports books, especially if you were a winner, where you know they would try to limit you and stuff. So the kids these days, they don't know how easy they have it. Man, I can't wait to get into this uh, with you. But here's where I'd like to start. What was your life actually like before becoming a professional better? What were you up to? Where you? Where are you from? What was your? What's your background? So it's interesting. Um, I worked for SureDog, who at the time, they were the number one MMA website. They've kind of fallen off since then a bit. Uh, they're still around, though. Um, I worked for them for a couple of years. And while I was there, I was doing live radio with them. Originally, I just started off as a phone screener, actually, just basically a nothing position and moved my way up eventually to being on the air. And I started doing basically fight picks and stuff on there, just like regular predictions. And the listeners kept telling me, why don't you try betting? You seem to have a really good read on these fights. You seem really accurate. And I guess I was always kind of under the impression that, you know, the house always wins. There's not really a real way to win at, at gambling long term. So I was actually kind of resistant to it. I don't come from a family that's into any kind of like betting at all, not poker, not the lottery, nothing. So uh, it was a very foreign thing for me to get into. But I made the mistake that I feel like a lot of people do, which is thinking that just because you know the sport and you're good at analyzing it, that then you can be successful betting at it. But thankfully, because I was so dedicated to it, I learned the other part of it, which was actually learning gambling theory and how to actually profit at the uh, sports books, given the lines, the odds, figuring out how to analyze percentages and all that. So going into it, I did, you know, kind of have the thought of, oh, OK, well, yeah, I guess I do know the, the sport really well. I should be able to do well at this very quickly learned, despite my early success, that I was going to need to put a lot more work into it and then shifted basically my entire prioritization of my life into sports betting. And for the next, uh, man, about a decade, basically, that was my entire life was just learning how to sports bet. Uh, that, that only took like a couple of years, but learning how to be very good at it, learning how to basically be the best version of myself I could be. It was just a, a true dedicated uh, full time thing for me. Yeah, clearly over the years, you've put in the reps in various aspects you know, of the game. Uh, do you remember the very first bet you, you, you wagered and placed? It was 2011. It was the fight night with Phil Davis against Minotaro Noguera. And I had two bets there. It was a parlay, Michael McDonald, along with Phil Davis, and then Phil Davis by decision. Now, both those bets won, went 2-0, pretty easy 2-0 as well. And... Who knows what would have happened if they got they had gone Owen to maybe, you know, again, given my, you know, resistance to sports betting, maybe it would have been like, ah, yes, yeah, it is just, you know, a pipe dream, as my mom actually called it. I remember um, I was working for SureDog and I started betting there and I bet for maybe about a year and I was like, OK, I'm actually good at this. I have the hang of this. I was making more on betting than I was making uh, from my, my pay there. So I quit to do that full time. And when I told my mom, I remember vividly in the kitchen telling her my decision and she went well that's just a pipe dream i've never let her forget that since then i always joke about it every time you know there's anything successful related to it i go oh, pretty good for a pipe dream 
Not bad at all. So, so at what point, or how long do you do you think it took before you were able to, to, for lack of a better word, bet on yourself and actually go full time in this business? I did it after a year, but if I could go back in time, I would say I probably should have waited until maybe three years. I would say about three years is when I felt like I really had a good handle on it because I've been watching MMA for over half my life since I was like 14 or 15, uh, early UFC 40s. So um, I already knew the sport extremely, extremely well. It wasn't about, you know, analyzing fights or figuring out how to pick winners, but there's a very big difference between going this guy's a more likely winner than that guy. And then going, okay, at minus 320, he's so much more of a likely winner that there's actually value in it. And that's where people seem to get a little bit tripped up where they think, oh, okay, like as long as they win, the odds almost don't matter in a way. And so um, for me, I took, I'd say about three years to really get my gambling theory down. Um, I never really had much issue with like the emotional side of betting, which is a big issue for a lot of people. They have like a chase mentality, or just other sort of biases. I think everybody has a chase mentality to an extent. It's just about how much you can resist it. Um, I'd say it probably took me maybe two years before I didn't even have like the temptation to chase bets anymore. But then, like I said, three years is when, if I could go back in time, I feel like that was when I really had a real solid handle on things. Fortunately, it worked out for me. I happened to win the first couple of years before then too. But like I said, I feel like it was almost beginner's luck in a way where I did well, but... Not to say that I shouldn't have done well, but there was definitely some some ways that I could have messed up with some poor bankroll management, some other things that I just happened to get a bit fortunate with. Right. And, you know, these days there are so many experts and analysts out there. I mean, you are one of them. But back in the day, were you able to re- leverage anybody else that had the experience of betting or gambling? And, and you know, you mentioned something like, you know, gambling theory. I don't know what gambling theory is. And were you kind of figuring this out as you went along or were there other sources or material for you to leverage and read upon to help you in your process? Well, that was probably honestly the trickiest part of everything is right now, like you mentioned, there's so many experts, uh, not just me, there's tons of other people who are legitimately good handicappers. Um, there was a time where like, I basically pioneered MMA handicapping where it was like, if you wanted to tail a winning sports better in MMA, I was like the only guy you could tail. That's changed now. Thankfully, there's a lot of people now who are successful, which is good to see, but back when I was very first starting out, especially there was like no resources to go with any kind of gambling theory or just general gambling knowledge I tried to pick up was from other sports. Maybe it was boxing or NFL. But the thing is, those sports are still so very different, even a sport like boxing. But especially if you're looking at a sport like, say, let's take baseball, for example, that is so much stat based in terms of batting percentages, all that kind of stuff, because you have such a high sample size. You have hundreds of games to go by over the course of the season, sometimes thousands of games. You have hundreds, if not thousands, of at-bats. In MMA, you're talking about a guy, okay, we have like Bo Nickel, a hyped prospect with a few fights and like under five minutes of combined fight footage. It's a very different game, right? You can't just sit there and look at his stats and go, okay, well, his stats are better than Israel Adesanya, so therefore he wins in a fight, right? doesn't work that way. In baseball or NFL, some of these other sports, it's very different. And so one thing that MMA has um, different than other sports, even to an extent uh, over boxing, is the styles make fights aspect. It's much more like a puzzle when you're trying to figure out who's going to win fights. And so in a sport like boxing, that does exist to an extent, and sure it exists in other sports as well. But generally speaking, in most sports, the better fighter or the better athlete or the better team is going to win more often than not. It's not the case in MMA where you can have someone who is objectively up here as a fighter facing someone who's objectively down here as a fighter, but this person has really bad takedown defense and this person has really great wrestling and they lay and pray them to a decision and get a huge upset. So MMA has a lot of more extreme examples like that, but also more nuanced examples where there's subtle differences in a matchup that people maybe don't realize. And so it's not just about who's the better fighter or who's the worst fighter. It's much more about figuring out the stylistic matchup. And that's why tape study is so important. That's why having an actual understanding of the skills and the techniques involved in the sport is very important. And so now, like, like I said earlier, kids these days don't realize how easy they have it. You can just go out there and find almost infinite resources in terms of how to analyze fights, how to bet on them, just in terms of tailing people blindly. 
Back in the day, man, it was a lot of trial and error on my part. My success would have been definitely accelerated if I didn't have to do so much of that. Yeah, like you said, you are a pioneer. And speaking of, you know, back in the day, did you ever find yourself in a situation where you couldn't believe some of the lines that were being presented to you? Because you come from a Sherdog background, so I would definitely classify you as an old school OG hardcore MMA fan. And even myself back in the day, I would sometimes see betting lines and I couldn't believe that the bookies were, you know, putting... Uh, Fighter X as an underdog where mm -hmm. a lot of us in the hardcore MMA community would be so high on said fighter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the best example of that back in the day, especially like the sure dog days, was Tough Fighters. Oh my goodness, the hype from Tough Fighters. You would have a guy like a mediocre Tough Fighter who has a record of like 11 and 8 in MMA, 1 and 1 in the UFC, and the UFC brings over some guy from Europe who's like 8-0 hyped prospect over there. American fans, no idea who he is. And on paper, you look at that fight, the 8-0 guy is going to absolutely destroy the tough guy. Like it's going to be just a first round destruction. And yet he's like a plus 300 underdog. That happened all the time back in the day. I think that's a big reason why when I said in my first couple of years, I kind of almost got fortunate. It wasn't necessarily that I look at it and go, oh man, I got all these robberies in my favor or something like that. It's more so the landscape was just so absurd back then that you could actually get away with not having the best understanding of gambling theory and knowledge and all that just because you'd be like, well, obviously this guy's going to get destroyed and he's a minus 400 favorite, pretty easy to bet the other side. So you don't see lines like that all that often anymore. Um, I think one of the more, most recent examples of something I can remember that extreme was Robert Whitaker against uh, Derek Brunson, which was several years ago now. He was a uh, plus 130 underdog there, plus 425 by knockout and a five rounder. When, let's be honest here, knowing what we know about both fighters, that's a pretty absurd line. Like Robert Whitaker to win should not be an underdog and him to win by knockout is by far the most likely outcome. So that was a max bet for me at the time for those reasons. And since then, we've had some decent lines like that, but it's just, it's kind of gotten a little bit less and less throughout the years, you know, maybe five years, 10 years before that, that Whitaker situation, he would be plus 300 and said he was plus 125. That same situation today, Whitaker is like minus 250, minus 300. So you just don't see those types of insane lines all that often anymore. It's very rare, actually. And now this may be a, a silly question, but, you know, we're so used to just being able to tap on our phone or iPad or laptop to place a wager right now. But when you were starting out, did you have those kind of options or did you have to physically go to a casino and actually go and place a bet in hand in person? I've actually never bet in person at a casino. So when growing up, I, I'm from originally Minnesota. I moved to Las Vegas in 2018. Uh, Minnesota, they have like some poker and sports books, like horse books, but they're kind of like spaced out. It's not like, you know, Vegas where they're just kind of everywhere. Um, so I never actually did anything in person physically. I just did like with the offshore ones back in the day, like a bookmaker, five dimes. It was still kind of a wild, wild west though, because some of those books um, were very reliable and good. And like Bookmaker, for example, I always recommended them very uh, much back in the day for that reason. It was you know, they didn't have the best lines usually, to be honest, but they were very reliable. They were not going to take your money or anything like that. Some of the other books, I mean, I've had tens of thousands of dollars stolen from me for no reasons, literally just winning bets and the sportsbook manager gets mad that you beat them. And so they just close your account for no reason. And back in the day, it was illegal for them to run a sportsbook from the U.S. So that's why they were offshore. But it was fully legal for you as a person to bet at the sportsbook. The problem was if you wanted to pursue any legal action, like say, for example, a sports book in Costa Rica steals tens of thousands of dollars, there's not really a path for you to do that with the, the legal system because, again, it's that kind of gray area and they're in another country and everything. So basically what would happen back in the day is that was a regular thing that would happen to not just me, but other sports bettors I know where sometimes you just log in after a big streak and the whole streak was gone and starting from scratch at that book. So like I said, kids these days do not know how easy they truly have it.
That's wild. And so you mentioned there that you moved to Vegas in, in 2018. So you've been living there now for about what, five or six years. What yeah. was that like, just transitioning from Minnesota to the fight capital of the world? You, ha you have all these MMA and UFC events taking place there. It's very, very easy to, to, to place wages and bet and gamble. Um, but both from a professional and from a personal perspective, what was it like moving to Vegas? Very different than Minnesota, that's for sure. Um, people, when they think of Minnesota, they think of like the movie Fargo and stuff. I'm not from that part of Minnesota. I mean, I guess that's technically the Dakotas, but uh, I'm from the, the cities in Minnesota. So, you know, it's not like I'm some, you know, hillbilly or something like that. You know, I'm from like more of the cities, the suburbs and that. So transitioning to Vegas wasn't that different in terms of that aspect, but the people in Vegas are definitely very different. The whole environment in Vegas is very different. It's funny, you know, I say some negative things on Twitter and stuff about Vegas sometimes, uh, but people th seem to think that because of that, I, I hate it or I have something against it. Well, A, I wouldn't have chosen to move here if that was the case, and B, I wouldn't have chosen to stay if that was the case. So I do like Vegas. It has a lot of good aspects, but I think the thing for me, and Sean Strickland actually talked about this recently at the post-fight press conference after his last win, there's a very weird type of Stockholm syndrome in Vegas where, like, he's talked about how the education in Vegas is bad, which is true. It has, I think, the second worst education in the country, the worst health care in the country, a bunch of, like, bad statistics in terms of crime and that. So there's some dark sides to the city, and he's pointed that out. And I guess he said that one of the UFC doctors after the win was like, hey, why are you talking bad about Vegas? And then he was like, okay, doc, like, where, do you, where do you take your kids to school? And the doctor just smiled at him because he takes them to private school. Because kind of proving what Sean said to be true, right? And I've run into that over and over and over again in Vegas, where people will be like, well, what, what do you, don't you like about Vegas? And I'll be like, blah, 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 the, you know, the education or the healthcare. And then they'll be like, well, yeah, but so. And I'm like, well, those are kind of important things. I don't know. I kind of want to be around smart people, have my health taken care of, not be a victim of violent crime. So there's just those things that I feel like people don't know about Vegas that are, are, are present, but it doesn't mean that the town is terrible or not worth visiting or not worth living in. Again, I still love a lot about it. Um, there's a lot of stuff to do here. There's a lot happening. It's the fight capital of the world. It's a very free place. It's just, if you're someone who's like, you know, some middle America family of four, you know, thinking about somewhere where you're moving, you know, your kids to and you think Vegas seems like a cheap, nice place, eh, maybe not the best place for a family. That's all. And can you see yourself living in Vegas for the foreseeable future for the rest of your life? Or do you think at some point you'd want to relocate somewhere else? It would depend. It's definitely good for work and business purposes, even just aside from UFC stuff. The amount of things that are constantly going on here, uh, conventions and stuff. I mean, there'll be like a, a random time where the city is absolutely jammed and you're thinking, wow, what's going on? It's like the president here or something. And it turns out there's some national concrete convention that's brought thousands upon thousands of people. So whatever business you're in, whatever business you're trying to get into, Vegas has opportunities for you. So like I said, it's a great place for a variety of reasons. Overall, I like Vegas. It's just, I feel like a lot of people deny that there are some negative aspects about it. I feel like some people should be aware of what they're getting into if they're going to come here. So at the top of the show, I mentioned that you know, sports betting and sports gambling really exploded in, in the last couple of years, and especially during uh, COVID as well. For anyone that's maybe thinking about betting or is new to the space, could you, in your own words, just describe how and why this happened? What happened? What created this explosion in the last few years? Uh, well, specifically, they passed the law to make it fully legal throughout the US. So like I said before, there was like that odd gray area where it was technically legal to bet on sports. Like when I turned in everything, you know, I said that I bet on sports and everything. It was never like anything I hid. It was a public figure. I used my real name. My name's actually Luca Fury and everything. So it's not like I was ever hiding that kind of stuff. So the difference though was, for example, even me um, doing my podcast back in the day, I could not advertise my podcast basically anywhere, not on Twitter, Facebook, Google ads, YouTube, like you name it, because anything related to sports betting, automatic no, like they considered it like alcohol, like other types of stuff, completely against it. Even places where you could advertise more extreme stuff like marijuana, no sports betting. So it was very much like you know, kind of said, like an, a wild, wild west sort of feel back in the day. And so before that law was passed, I couldn't advertise. Other places couldn't advertise. So imagine a, a company like, say, DraftKings is around back then. 
uh, which they were actually. They were uh, actually um, in their first year. I was actually sponsored with them when they were just uh, fantasy. They sponsored my website back in the day, but they weren't a, a sports book back then because sports betting was obviously not legal here in the U.S. yet. And even if they were, say they were a sports book offshore, well, they wouldn't be able to advertise anywhere. So it'd just be such a a kill to you know the business in terms of trying to grow it. So. Once that law was passed, not only could these companies move onshore to the U.S., but then they could actually advertise, which, well, if you're an MMA fan or a fan of any sport, you've probably seen the absolute spamming of all sorts of different ads from all sorts of sports books on every channel, even if it's not sports. So that was the big thing that uh, changed things, is that sports books could then be operated in the U.S., and then also you could now advertise relating to sports books. So that opened the door for DraftKings and the US, UFC working together, et cetera, et cetera. And did you see an overnight impact in, in your line of work? And, and what was the overall impact this has had on you over, say, the last two or three years? So I took a break from everything when I moved to Vegas um, at the end of 2017, start of 2018. So when that all passed, um, it was in progress. Like I knew it was going to pass right about the time that I was, um, at the time, just retiring. I was planning, actually, not to come back to uh, MMA stuff, but... Eventually, you know, I was still betting and stuff while I was taking the break and everything, and it's always going to be my biggest passion in life. So I was like, eh, I should probably just go back to doing this publicly again. So I was not doing it publicly at the time it officially passed, but I could see just on, you know, like I said, the the advertisements, uh, the way betting was now accepted. Like the UFC, even back in the day, once in a while, you get maybe some vague references from John Anik about someone cashing as a big underdog on the broadcast. But now, obviously, betting is such an integrated part of the discussion, the graphics constantly, props to watch, the live odds they have and everything. So it really was kind of a night and day difference in terms of the whole, not just acceptance, because I think in terms of like people involved in the sport, they always were kind of okay with sports betting. But it was more of the allowance to be able to actually, you know, again, advertise and all that stuff. And I think it's no secret that a big reason why the UFC has put so much of the betting stuff into the broadcast is because of their advertising partners and that. So again, the the door opening up for advertisers to actually being able to advertise betting was a huge, huge thing for sports betting to become actually normalized in the U.S. Yeah, I see like so much uh, sports programming getting sponsored and in most cases funded exclusively by Mm -hmm. some of these bookies. Um, And even some journalists or media personalities have affiliations, exclusive deals with with betting partners. But in general, what do you think the ceiling of this industry now is? And are we even close to that ceiling or is there still a lot of growth to come? I think eventually it's going to become... Not necessarily, not necessarily part and parcel about watching sports, but think about why do people watch sports? Like if you're, say, a diehard, I don't know, Green Bay Packers fan, you tune in because there is stakes to that game, right? If it's an irrelevant game where you're 2-13, and 13, it's the end of the season, you're facing another team that's like 2-13, and 13, how excited, how interested are you in that game? It's still your favorite team. It's still your favorite players, but there's no stakes to it, so you don't really care. Well, betting, whether there's already stakes in the game or not for you, it adds stakes to it. So you can basically, with betting, create interest in literally any game, any contest. And it's one of the reasons why the UFC, I'm sure, is putting, again, you know, all the props to watch and stuff. They're trying to get people to know, hey, look at all these different ways You can find interest in these fights. And I guess at the end of the day, you can debate whether that's a healthy thing to do or not. Personally, where I side on things is people should be free to make their own choices. I think, yeah, you should, you know, make protections to certain situations and, you know, give information to people, you know, let them know this is, you know, something that could be risky. It's gambling, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, someone who's deciding to, you know, throw $100 on some prop on John Jones was that hundred dollars really going to go to something that meaningful anyways, or was it just going to go to, I don't know, beer money or whatever else. Right. So I feel like in general, it's not necessarily a bad thing to get betting so involved in things. Um, and I think that it's probably, like I said, not going to become part and parcel where it's like every time everybody's watching sports, they have to bet it. But I do think it's going to become increasingly normalized where right now you're already kind of seeing it where people are betting like almost everything every day that they're watching. But people still kind of frown upon that or look at them as kind of like a degenerate. I think eventually that kind of behavior is going to become more normalized where it's like, oh, you're a sports fan. You're also someone who bets on them. Right. And, you know, you did mention that as this 
you know, industry was getting more and more legalized, regulated, and this explosion happened, you know, you were on a break. And did you just want to walk away completely? Were you happy with, I don't know, the money you had made or the kind of life that you had led? What were some of the reasons about you taking this break? And what were you up to during the break as well? Uh, so it was a couple of reasons. One, I moved to Las Vegas, so it was, you know, obviously very different life. Um, but more so than that, like I was still betting during that span. I still did well on bets. But being a public handicapper is very different than just betting on your own. And people who maybe even don't give out bets know what I'm talking about. Like if you're an analyst of any kind in MMA, if you ever get a pick wrong, you get, you know, grief from people. But it's not so much like trolling and stuff that bothers me. It's more so... People, definitely when you're a handicapper, you figure out why the sports books are very successful at what they do. People are very emotional about betting, and it is just so hard for people to separate that. And so the thing that really the only thing, honestly, that bothers me as a public handicapper is having to basically emotionally babysit grown men when a bet doesn't win or an event doesn't win or, God forbid, a month doesn't win. And then it's, you know, the sky is falling, doom and gloom, end of the world, never going to win again. What are we going to do? And it's like, it doesn't matter how good of a win streak you're on. I mean, I just had a, a thing recently where I won six months in a row, was like almost perfect in that six months, then had a losing month where it was a pretty weak month from the UFC, only had a single digit number of bets, only lost a single digit number of units. So a very small losing month at that. And of course, the doom and gloom and the end of the world, the freaking out. And it's like, it doesn't matter even if I just went six months almost perfect. It's just if you don't hit literally 100 percent, you're going to deal with that from people. So people do have like this weird expectation of perfection. I've seen it with other handicappers. I've seen it with other sports. And so I guess imagine yourself if you're like, say, working for uh, a business and say you're a member of the board and you have board meetings. Something I actually do for one, one business I have. And imagine that for six months, your business crushes and everybody's happy. And then for one month, it takes just a slight dip. And one of the people at the board meeting is just freaking out, having a temper tantrum, acting like it's the end of the world. And every single time that you go through any kind of dip or any kind of stagnation, this person does that. So it doesn't matter how much you win, doesn't matter how good you're doing on the quarter, any little imperfection, this person's having a temper tantrum. How often before that person's voted off the board? Like grown men don't want to deal with just emotional temper tantrums like that. And yet, if you are a handicapper, it just doesn't matter. Like I said, what sport you're doing, whether you're doing free content, paid content, emotionally babysitting people every single time you are anything less than perfect is just part and parcel of the job. And so I think for me, that's the biggest reason, honestly, why I stepped away is I just got tired of like, Constantly have to walk walk people off of the ledge and explain why, hey, you're still up, you know, 80% over this last handful of months. Dropping 5% really isn't that big of a deal. Like the constant same conversations. Like, and again, it'd be one thing if it was like a logical conversation, but when you're sitting there feeling like, oh man, why am I having to do it? It gets really, really tiring after 13 years. So that was the main reason why I stepped away. And since coming back, that's the main thing that I, I dislike about it too. Oh, so you're still dealing with this to this day. So when oh, you yeah, came back yeah, from this like, break, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I just had uh, started giving out bets again. First six months, I was almost perfect. Didn't even right. have back-to-back -back losing events. And then the first losing month I had, it was like six units uh, over, over the course of like eight or nine bets. And it was, oh my God, the sky is falling, everything. And I was like, oh my God, even to this day, even after a great six-month win streak, it's just never good enough. So yeah, it's just part of the job. What do you think is the, the biggest misconception uh, about betting on sports or maybe betting specifically in MMA? I think the biggest thing, and it's kind of a more of a nuanced thing, is I think people um, have a misconception that you can figure out sure things about matchups when everything is a game of percentages, whether you're talking about a pick whether you're talking about who you favor to be the better striker, the chances of them getting a knockout decision, whatever the case may be. I mean, every little nuance of the matchup, it's a game of percentages. There's no sure thing. You'll basically never hear me in any of my breakdowns go, there's no chance this can happen because it's MMA. We know really anything can happen. And I think people get the impression that you should be able to find like locks consistently or have just absolute sure fire conviction on certain aspects of matchups like I think that's probably the biggest criticism I'll get from people 
um, whether I'm winning or losing, whatever period I'm going through is people don't like if I ever say that a fight is not like a one-sided lock. Like for me, for my analysis, what I feel is proper analysis to do is I name one fighter's skills and weaknesses. I name the other fighter's skills and weaknesses. I name the way this fighter can win and lose. I name the way this fighter can win and lose. And then I say who I favor to, and I give a rough percentage based on everything I've analyzed about the matchup. So basically covering all the bases in terms of what each fighter is good, bad, et cetera. But I'm still making a pick. I'm still saying who I favor. Well, I'll constantly get criticized for that, saying, oh, you're playing both sides by naming how both guys can win and lose when... Like, imagine going into any other investment. Like, imagine you're looking to buy a house for an investment property, and you're talking to a realtor about it, and you're like, okay, what are the pros and cons? And they go, I'm only going to tell you the pros. I'm not going to tell you any of the cons. Let's just pretend this is a lock. You're like, well, I'm about to put a million dollars on this property. I'd like to know if there's flooding or anything. No, no, no. It's a lock. I know there's some cons, but I'm not going to tell you because I want to give you confidence. You'd be like, this is really stupid, I want to weigh all my options and make the best decision, right? So most people get that, but then there's that small percentage of people who just kind of don't get it. And I don't know if it's maybe because you see like some sort of like the scam handicappers out there who are promoting like, you know, 101, you know, on my last, like 100 wins and one loss over the last 101 events or, you know, scammy stuff like that, like these unrealistic win rates. I don't know if it has something to do with that, but it is interesting that people seem to not be able to grasp the concept that predictions are a game of percentages, not certainties. Right. You know, it's so easy these days to create an account, link it to your to your bank account, and you can start wagering and betting within minutes. So mm-hmm. if someone has no experience in betting on MMA specifically, but wants to get involved, what would be your general advice to that person? Bankroll management, I would say number one is the most important thing. Um, Not to promote my own stuff, but on my Patreon, I actually have a whole episode of a podcast, Luca's Lecture, dedicated just to bankroll management because literally it's one of the most absolute important things. Um, I mean, for me, I preach never betting more than 5% bankroll per bet. Usually I'm only betting one, maybe 2% bankroll per bet. So if you think about that, if you're betting uh, only 1% bankroll per bet, you have to lose 100 bets in a row to lose your entire bankroll. So obviously pretty much impossible, right? Here's the problem. If you're betting, say, 10% bankroll, now it's only 10 bets in a row that you have to lose. And sure, that's very unlikely, but think about it from a logical standpoint. Say that right now you start out and you're doing 10% bankroll per bet. And you do good because it is unlikely to lose 10 bets in a row. So you do well for, say, let's just make it unrealistic. Let's say for five years, you do great with that strategy without running into issue. You'd run into issue before that, but let's just say for argument's sake, you go five years and it's fine. At this point, you've racked up, let's say, again, for argument's sake, a $10 million bankroll. But then the losing streak finally happens. You get robbed a couple of fights. Your guy's up two rounds to zero, suffers a fluke knockout. Suddenly 10 bets in a row happens, which is an inevitability over time if you do this long enough. Well, $10 million you've racked up, the five years of hard work, it's gone in just a couple of weeks on that 10 bet losing streak. And so that is why bankroll management is so important is because yes, if you have improper bankroll management, poor proper poor bankroll management, uh, you can definitely build your bankroll faster and people get greedy because of that. But eventually, it is just inevitable that you will go on some sort of a losing streak. And if you're betting too much, you will lose everything or a significant amount. So if you're betting, a say, 1% bankroll long term, it's not to say it's impossible to lose, you know, 100 bets in a row or go on some kind of crazy losing streak, but very, very, very unlikely. And at that point, regardless of whether you're winning, losing, you don't have to worry about adjusting your bankroll. You don't have to worry about panicking because that's another area that people actually get affected with. Let's say... Again, in that 10% situation, let's say you lose five bets in a row. Now you've lost 50% of your bankroll. Are you going to sit there and be like, okay, well, now I only have five bets to spare. F it. Let's just go with it. No, you're probably going to get freaked out. You're probably going to get emotional. And now you're probably going to say cut your bankroll or cut your bet amount down to say maybe only 5%. Well, now it's going to take you twice as long to make back the amount that you just lost. So there's just so many reasons. Again, I did a whole podcast on this that... Bankroll management is by far the number one most important aspect of sports betting, and it is also by far the number one biggest uh, area that I see people make mistakes. Like, I've basically never seen anybody 
come into sports betting and within the first two years not have just disastrous bankroll management. So that's something that usually takes a long time, but the quicker you can get it down, oh man, the better. You know, I was reading your bio and obviously I, I've known you for a long time and I've known, I've been aware of you, known, known over you and, and your work. But one thing I wasn't aware of is some of the analyst work that you've done for fighters and for their camps. Could you speak to that a little bit? Because I had no idea that this is part of some of the services that you've pr actually provided to to camps and coaches and fighters. Yeah, it's interesting now with all, you know, this insider betting stuff, I guess it's kind of like taboo now to be involved with fighters and stuff. So uh, I haven't been doing that in a bit now. But yeah, in the past, I did used to uh, work with some fighters, never bet on or against them or anything in their matchups. So <laughs> didn't do anything uh, sketchy in that regard. But uh did well for the most part. I uh, actually worked with a couple of UFC champions at one point. Uh, only ever lost one uh, f fight for a fighter that I worked with. Uh, I think in total maybe did like five or six fights uh, with different fighters. So overall it went well. Um, to be honest, I feel like one day, like my future, honestly, in the sport might be getting more into coaching because I still feel like Coaching has definitely gotten significantly better, especially in just like the last maybe two or three years. I've noticed a significant improvement. Like you've obviously been around the sport for a very long time, of course. Um, you know, back in the day, guys like Greg Jackson, Faraz Zahabi, they were so notable and kind of outliers because there wasn't that many really great coaches. But if you looked at the stuff they were doing, that really should have been the standard for MMA. I mean, it was just kind of not to insult them, but, you know, kind of like basic proper coaching type of stuff, you know, getting guys on diets, actually coming up with game plans and stuff. Obviously, they were doing more than that. But my point is, at that point in time, the state of MMA coaching, like, you had guys where them and their coaches were not even watching tape on opponents in the UFC. They would sign fights and just go out there and have the mentality of, well, I'm just going to do what I'm best at and not realizing they're facing, you know, some jujitsu wizard who's trying to leg lock them. So, Coaching has gotten so much better, but I still feel like there's definitely some areas for improvement, especially in terms of uh, game planning and analysis. I think there's certainly some very, very high level coaches out there doing some great stuff, but I still don't think it's as widespread throughout the sport as it should be. Yeah, and another thing I saw in the bio again, and people don't know how big and tall you are until they actually maybe perhaps meet you in person. But one of the things I saw in the, on the bio is you've been a bodyguard. And I yeah. have no idea, but you have lived, I think, the most craziest life of anyone that I can think of in MMA when it comes to gambling, you know, your own businesses, you know, you've done some coaching with fighters. Where did the bodyguard situation come into play? Uh, so I was out here in Vegas. I actually almost was a bodyguard for Tyson Fury at one point. Uh, my friend was doing it for him, and uh, I can't remember. He was supposed to have a fight. And I think it was going to be in Vegas and he was going to come out here and train for a few months. And the fight either got moved or canceled. So I was actually going to be his bodyguard uh, during that time. Um, but then, yeah, that fell through. I still met him actually and stuff. He's a real, real great dude. Very friendly. Uh, but yeah, I did some bodyguard work for mostly NBA teams. Uh, that was fun. Got to have some fun interactions with, uh, I, guess, I won't say their name, but there was a very, very popular rapper who was trying to steal uh, some of the women from the basketball player's table. And so big part of being a bodyguard in the uh, the clubs is basically just like protecting literally that from happening because it's a very common thing. And so this rapper kept coming over, over, and over and over again. And they're smaller in stature. And so eventually I was like, all right, F it. I literally picked him up like a small child, carried him over to his table in front of all of his women, sat him down in the chair like a child, and then everybody just looked at him with shame. And he was very, very bad, I will say that. That's hilarious. And and is this something that you're still actively doing when the opportunity presents itself? Or is that now just something that you did in the past? I did it uh, more just because like, it wasn't something like I sought out. It was more just like I had some random opportunities where I was like, oh, sure. Yeah, that sounds fun. I'll do it. Um, so if opportunities came again, I would definitely do it. But uh, yeah, except not something I'm actively seeking out, but definitely brought some fun experiences. Um, definitely hanging with the NBA players. There were some places where I was literally thinking to myself, I'm like, I am literally like in a rap video right now. Like there's just all red in here with the lights. There's just smoke everywhere. I can't see more than like one foot in front of me very scantily clad women around every corner like there's there's some interesting times in las vegas i bet i bet well you know you mentioned this earlier on but you do have a patreon fury's fight picks and could you just 
you know, the floor is yours. You know, what are the services you provide? What are the tiers? How long have you been doing this for now? Uh, and also, you know, you've got this beautiful setup and now we've spoken a little bit, you know, privately. And now I've seen you kind of like build your set, you know, over the course of the last year or so. So what's that journey been like for you as well to actually build this set, do more podcasting, creating more content and obviously build a Patreon as well? Yeah, so in the past, um, when I was doing this before, you know, I was mostly giving out my bets and then I had a podcast. I would do like some occasional writing here and there. I had a website back in the day, but I didn't do much stuff with video and I didn't do as much podcasting stuff as I'm doing now. So when I decided to return, like I said, it was not for like money or anything like that. It was because this was my passion. Um, as much as I don't like the emotional, uh, you know, hand holding I have to do sometimes with people, I actually do like the whole interactions that I get with people, helping people win money and all that. I find that very rewarding. I mean, the messages I've gotten over the years of like paying for people's weddings, paying for people's cars with the money that they've won from my bets and stuff. So it's a very rewarding thing. So um, when I came back, I wanted to focus more on. Uh, a big part definitely on education. So I did, uh, like I said, the Lucas Lecture Series where I have like, um, it's more of like a how-to instructional thing. So I talk about how I take study fights, um, bankroll management, uh, my seven-day process for deciding bets. So if people want to get like more of a real behind the scenes, like sort of inside look in my mind of how well a true professional MMA sports better actually approaches this stuff, I basically spill all the beans over in uh, that series. Um, also, have, of course, all the prediction stuff, because I know people like that. I do give out bets and stuff there as well. Um, I have a fantasy fight forecast I do where I talk about fights that we never got to see, like George St. Pierre versus Anderson Silva. So basically, I'm just trying to look at, I guess that the whole goal of the Patreon really was to look at my skill set as someone, like I said, been doing this true professional for 13 years, someone who pioneered this industry I kind of looked at what value can I actually bring? Because obviously there's a lot of people doing analysis now. There's a lot of people even doing betting and stuff like that now. So just bringing bets to the table isn't something particularly unique. Um, just picking fights isn't particularly unique. So I wanted to leverage more um, the historical side of my knowledge, uh, the technical side, the sort of trial and error that I went through. And basically, if someone's either just trying to start to get into sports betting or someone maybe has been doing it for a while and is trying to improve, they can basically sign up, view the different podcasts and not just look at like the backlog of content, but also follow along each week as I explain my process and everything and actually get better as a sports better themselves. So in the past, I would say the biggest difference is I was just kind of giving out my bets and stuff and people could follow along. Whereas now I'm actually trying to actively educate and improve people as sports betters themselves. No, it's a great service. I'll definitely link um, the Patreon in, in the bio of the YouTube video. So, uh, Luca, the way I like to end all my conversations and interviews is something... The bit for a little, social? The bit for social. There you go. Yeah. It's catching on. Um, so for you, what I thought would be fun is if I just throw out a few kind of hypothetical or potential situations or fights in MMA. And I just want you to give me what you think the line would be on these situations actually occurring. All right. So to start so the line on these actually happening. Yeah. So if you were to create the line, what would it be hypothetically in these situations? Okay. All, right? all right. So interesting. All right. All right. So first of all, Ronda Rousey returning for a fight in the UFC. To be honest, I kind of feel like there's a very good chance of that happening. At this point in time, I would say more likely than not. She apparently is leaving the WWE. Amanda Nunes is gone. The featherweight division basically is a division that is built just for one fighter to reign over top and basically be a draw by themselves. That was Amanda Nunes. She's gone. I don't know. It seems pretty, pretty easy for Ronda Rousey to just slide right in there and probably be able to beat a lot of those fighters, if not all of them. What would you set the line at then? Hmm. It's tough because I guess it depends on her. I definitely think the UFC is all about it. I think the way that their business model works now, even if it's a one-off fight, they would be all for it. I would say at this point in time, I'll do minus 150, 60%. Okay. How about Conor McGregor versus Michael Chandler taking place in 2023? Ooh, I'm going to say plus 200. I think it'll happen, well, honestly, I don't even know if it's going to happen. That's kind of 50-50 as well. I think if you look at 
um, Conor McGregor, if he wanted this fight, there's a lot of things he could have done to make it clear he wanted the fight. Doesn't seem like he wants it based on his tough performance. Seems like he's just there to promote his own stuff. Doesn't seem like he's really interested in fighting very much, period, actually, at this point. Then you have the whole uh, USADA issue. I don't see how the U- UFC is able to talk their way out of that. So I think that fight may be 50-50 even happening, period. And if it does, I, mean, I just can't see it being this year. Okay. What about the PFL buying Bellator? It's interesting. I think that would actually be, well, I don't know all the, the business details of, you know, both of them in terms of the financials, but from an outsider perspective, it seems like it'd be a smart thing to do because right now the UFC, this is the only time I can remember them. And you can probably attest this as well, being somewhat vulnerable as the number one MMA organization. Back when Pride was around, of course, they had a legitimate number two. There was, you know, real competition. There was debate over who had the best fighters. Since they uh, absorbed Pride, though, there's really been no clear number two even. It's just been the UFC and kind of everybody else. Now Bellator and PFL have greatly improved the rosters. They've started to sign some big fighters. UFC has let some of them walk. If Bellator and PFL combine together, they have the ESPN deal. They could actually be a legitimate competitor to the UFC potentially. So, like I said, I don't know all the, you know, intricacies of their financials maybe it doesn't make sense for that reason but from a fan perspective looking at their rosters and all that i think it'd be very interesting and if you had to set the line on that actually happening uh that i would put as an underdog i think i'd say plus 250 okay how about dana white still being the ufc president 10 years from now 10 years from now that i'll put at plus 300. I think he'll be the president for a while. I don't think Dana will want to step down, but I think, man, 10 years is a long time to still be doing the same thing he's doing and not want to either move on to something else or just have, you know, the company feel like he's maybe, you know, lost a step or whatever. At that point, he'd be what, like 65-ish, something like that, going on 70. So I don't know if he still wants to be traveling all over the world in the, in the fight business at that age. So I think if anyone's going to do it, it would be Dana, but uh, I'll put that as definitely an underdog. And the final one, the UFC holding an event in Africa in 2024. Ooh, I'm not familiar with the logistics of them actually being able to go there, but I would imagine that that's something that's realistic, you know, like some of the other foreign shows. I'll say minus 130. I think they'll try to do it. I think it's a case too where if you're going to do it, you have to strike when the iron's hot. Obviously, you know, they have some champions that'd be very good for for that right now. Contender with obviously Drake is two plus C. So if they're going to do it, it's got to probably be within the next year. So I'll put that as a very slight favorite. Incredible. This was a lot of fun uh, for me, Luca. I really appreciate you you coming on the show. Uh, Fury's Fight Picks is the Patreon service. I'm going to link it in the bio. Good luck with that. Good luck with continuing to be a professional better. And good luck with the odd side gig of being maybe a bodyguard here or a business owner there. Uh, this, was a, this was a lot of fun. Like I said, I'm really uh, you know, glad that you um, accepted my invitation to come on. And yeah, uh, you know, we met last year during International Fight Week. And uh, I'll definitely make sure I hit you up when I'm in Vegas next time. Maybe we can uh, talk more about the, the fight game because uh, I think you've got a fantastic mind and so much experience as well. Yeah, I appreciate all the kind words. And uh, yeah, I feel the same way. I definitely would uh, like to hang out again in Vegas, maybe grab a drink and uh, maybe do another podcast as well sometime uh, uh, in the future as well. Absolutely. Appreciate you coming on, Luca. Take care and we'll speak to you soon. Thanks so much. Have a good one. Thanks for listening to this episode of Smack Talk with Sandu. It really means a lot to me. And hey, listen, if you enjoyed this episode, please go and give it a follow on Spotify and Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your shows.